Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming for my talk instead of going to the binder one. <laughs> so um, I think so, so you already come here, so I want to have a quick show of hands. How many of you have worked with more than one kernels? All of you, right? And how many of you have worked with uh, multiple kernels for one single project? Less, far less. So that means usually you stick with one kernel for one project. And how many have you used really Jupyter to work with large data in terms of good? Okay, there are several tools for that. And have you used any workflow systems like Slake Make, Galaxy? A few, okay. That's actually less than I expected because I think those workflow systems are very useful. So my answer to all those questions are yes, because I came from MD Anderson Cancer Center, which is world's, one of the largest cancer centers in the world and is one of the best. So because of the size of MD Anderson, we generate a huge amount of data, and in turn, we have one of the largest bioinformatics departments in the States, and we have 15 uh, faculty members who have been working uh, make major contributions to many national and international projects working on very uh, good tools. And we also have uh, 20 statistical analysts who have worked on, I think last year, about 400 projects for more than 100 PIs in our institution. So basically we are dealing a lot of data here. And the data, usually if the data come, if is from, generated from within the hospital, they usually come from the labs, right? And the, the samples and the blood would go to our sequencing core that we extract the DNA and RNAs, and then the data would go to our clusters. We have like five clusters over there, and that's we have the, uh, the large amount of storage over there. And then we, jump in and try to analyze the data. Because we are bioinformaticians, we use many, many different tools and on many different platforms. So that's why we usually need to move our data around, say from the cluster to the recommended servers to the individual workstations, and sometimes to laptops and desktops. And we write a lot of scripts on different places in different languages because we need to, for example, write batch scripts for the cluster and some other SAS script for a workstation. That's just, we just use, deal with different scripts. And that has caused many problems in terms that say, it's challenging to write and manage many scripts written in different languages and the, uh, for different environments. There's a problem with version control, project management, and the documentation and the sharing, right? And also, um, after a few months, when you come back, you look at your projects that can be consist of several scripts, and it also it can be a black box to you. It's really difficult to understand what people have done in the past. Also, we also have problems in managing data and workflows in different environments, because say I develop some scripts on my laptop, and then if I want to run the same script on different servers, I need to do different things. At least for different clusters, you have different wrapper scripts, configurations, and things like that. That's time consuming and sometimes challenging and error prone. So because of all those problems, we have considered some uh, options, and Jupyter was really promising to, to what we do. So we are here at the JupyterCon, so I don't think I need to read all the great things that Jupyter can do, right? But if we really want to use Jupyter for our own work, there's something still missing. The first thing I would say is for interactive data analysis. Because when you compare Jupyter, I, I would say classical Jupyter, because Jupyter Lab is doing many great things, and to, for example, R Studio. You, can, you could not run the, your script nine by nine and inspect your variables. You, you, you cannot generate a, a figure that shows outside the notebook so that you see if it's the correct one or things like that. If there's something missing about the interactive data analysis for Jupyter. Also, Jupyter only supports one kernel for one notebook. 
That means when I have my biomedical project, if I need to use multiple languages, multiple kernels, I would end up with multiple notebooks. That is uh, just troublesome, to, at least to me. So I would rather prefer having one notebook with all my analysis in it, right? And the last one is, I don't know if, how, how, how should I say that, because we really, really want a integrated workflow system for Jupyter, but that's unfair, because Jupyter is really, really good at what it's designed for, and asking Jupyter to do batch processing workflows is like asking you send Bolt to compete with uh, Michael Phelps in swimming. But if we, if we really want to use, there are actually many, many workflow tools. I just listed several popular ones. If we really want to use them with Jupyter, what that means, if you think about that, is that we have our scripts over here, then we need to copy paste our script to those tools, right? And then those tools generally have very different syntax. So we need to modify our script a lot and then run that. And then here we change that and we need to do that again. So if we do that for our daily data analysis, it's very counterproductive. So, so that in our department, no one actually use a workflow system for the batch data processing. That's, that's a problem. So that's why we developed SOS, and SOS has two parts. The first part is called SOS uh, Notebook. And usually, when you have Jupyter, and you say if you want to use Julia, right? You, you start a server, you create a Notebook, and if you want to work with Python, you start another server. If you want to work with R, then you create another server and another Notebook. What SOS does is that it's a super kernel that talk to all those kernels so that you only need to have one notebook server and you only have one notebook and that notebook can talk, with, talk to many different kernels. And we also have a SOS workflow system. The workflow system handles uh, the tasks that talk to the clusters, talk to dockers, and handle huge amount of data and complex workflows. And with this, and especially with the tight integration between the kernel and the workflow system, you can do everything inside the notebook interface. So basically in that notebook, you can control your job that submit to a cluster. I will talk about them in details, like, uh, so that's, get started from the notebook side. So, um, as I said, the SOS kernel is a super kernel to all Jupyter's kernels. Basically, it's very simple conceptually. It starts and shuts down other kernels, and I call them sub-kernels. And then when user enters some command from the notebook, and it just send the command to the kernels, and when the kernel finish evaluation, return the results, the SOS kernel just send the result back to the front end. And during this process, SOS can do something to expand the input and capture the output. I will show you what I mean by that. Say, there is a, a complete uh, notebook here. It's an SOS notebook. And you can see that um, this uh, notebook, the, you can see the difference right away, right? For every code cell, there's a drop-down box that lists all your kernels that are available to you on, on your server. Uh, and then, for, if you select that kernel, then the left-hand side will, marked, will be color-coded so that you know that which cell uses which kernel. So that's a, a visual indication. And the first cell is, is SOS. So I need to tell you right now, SOS is based on Python. So you can input whatever Python code into SOS cell. So that's a reassuring because that's not something alien to you. And for the second cell, it's a bash cell, and it just executes a command to count the number of lines from, from your notebook file. And then for the third code cell, it's a, there's a expand magic. So that, what that magic does is that if you have that magic, it treats 
the content of that cell as a Python F string. So you know, format string, right? Python 3.6 format string. So basically, if you have a variable and then in SOS kernel, you can expand that variable in that content before it's sent, sent to the underlying kernel. So this is very helpful, say, if you have a sample name and then you have multiple kernels working on the same sample, then you don't have to use that name again and again. You just pass a variable in all the kernels, right? So that's the input side. For the output, you, I have an example over there. If you run something and then you think the output is useful from a sub-kernel, you can use the capture uh, magic to capture that. And this example is particularly interesting because uh, the Spark kernel is something that I, I don't know what's going on. It's a RDF query, but it just gave me a bunch of links. And I want to make use of them. So what I would do is just use a capture magic. I would capture the results from the, from the sub-kernel. And then I would just use my beloved, beautiful SOAP module to analyze the output. And then at the end, I get the, the URLs, and then I can continue to analyze them, right? So that's the way you chain all the kernels. Basically, this is the standard way if you just try to work with all Jupyter kernels. But for the kernels that SOS understands, there is a much easier way to exchange information between kernels. So um, here, actually, I showed you three methods. Uh, there's three magics, get and put and with, and they're, they're actually method to uh, exchange data without magics. But everything boils down to a magic called get. So what this does is that, say, for example, if you have a very n in SOS, and then in an R kernel, you say, I get the variable from SOS. And then you do some calculation, and you can, back in SOS, you get the results from R. This is useful in the way that I know that certain things that can best be done in Python, something best can be done in R, so I don't have to choose, right? So when I'm doing something, I want to generate some random numbers. I just use R to do, to do the thing. I don't have to think about how to do that in Python. And how does how this magic works? I mean, like magic, right? So suppose you have a SOS kernel, and you have an R kernel. Suppose we have an array, one, two, three, in the Python, in the SOS kernel, and then if we want to put the array into R, what SOS does in this case is just execute some statements in R so that you have an array in R. And then, similarly, if you have a data frame in R, and you want to put that into Python, what SOS will do, because data frame can be huge, right, is first it saves the data frame to a file, to a temporary file, and then it would, in Python, in, in SOS, use another function to read the data frame from the, from the disk file, and then you have a data frame in, uh, in, in, in SOS. So, what I want to say here is that we are not transferring variable in any way from one kernel to the other. No, that, that's not the case. What we are actually doing is we are creating an independent variable in another kernel, but with the same name. Okay? And when we are trans transferring data from one kernel to, to another, and it can either be done directly between the subkernels or by way of SOS, depending on how the data change is, uh, is implemented. And also, SOS tries to create a variable of similar types because all languages are different, right? You can't find a one-to-one -one correspondence between data types. There's no way to do that. So what SOS does is that, for example, if we want to transfer uh, for a R, A, and B into, uh, into SOS. And if you know R good enough, you know that A and B are actually the same type. The, the, the A is an array of size one. They're the same type, but when they're transferred to Python, they appear as different types. One is an integer one, the other one is a list. And similarly, if you have a Julia 
in Julia, if you have a character, one single character, and if you have a hello, that's a string, there are two different types. When they are trans transferred to, to SOS, they appear as one single type of string because Python doesn't uh, differentiate between one character and one string. So what I mean here is that SOS tries best to do the transfer for you, but it doesn't try to get a really strict one-to-one -one correspondence whatsoever, just try to get information over, okay? And right now, uh, SRS supports 11 languages, and we are adding support for more. As that, that, that is the one that we support this kind of data exchange. Okay? Any question? <laughs> okay, then if there's no question, um, I will just say, so th those are about the internal, about the SOS kernel, but we also have some extensions from the front end. On the front end side, here I'm showing you a, a shortcut, control shift enter, that's a nine by nine execution. And what it does is that it runs the current line in a side panel. So for example, if I run the data equals to the second line over there, it will automatically preview the results in the side panel, which is immensely useful, at least to me, because when I do these things, right, I run one line, I want to know if that line has been doing what I want to do, if the result is correct. So in this way, I have the instant feedback of the results. And, for, and the, this shortcut can also run selected tags, and also it works for subkernels. So basically, this shortcut provides a, a way for you to debug your, 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 your code, your script in, the, in a cell. And uh, this function has been ported to JupyterLab, so if you're using JupyterLab, you can uh, assign a, a shortcut to a command called a running console, so that you can, do, you can use that. But, and, so on the last slide, I showed you how to use a, a how the preview magic was uh, triggered automatically by, us, by us SOS. But you can also uh, do that explicitly. For example, in this one, we get empty cards from R, and then we preview that variable in the side panel. In the side panel, you can actually sort your data frame and search in your data frame so that you can play with your data before you enter your next stage of analysis. And in the next example, the cell, the R cell, generate a file, and the magic will just show you the file, what, what it looks like. So the, the, the importance of showing you the temporary, temporary information during your integrity data and, and analysis, I think is very important, so I proposed a a pull request to JupyterLab, and it's still pending. So if you like this feature, you can go to JupyterLab and say, hey, I want this. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, so I wouldn't go into much details of all the magics, because as well as it provides uh, like 30 magics, but there are some magic that's particularly useful. I think I, I, I can uh, show you some of them here. So there is a magic called SOS save, which basically convert your S Oh, as a notebook to HTML, using some uh, templates that we provide. In this particular case, the template generates a table of content for you. If the document is long, table of content is very useful. And it also has a magic called revisions. So the revisions basically needs, it runs the git log command and shows all the revisions of this notebook so that if you click, you can go to back to your previous version of notebook. And also, it has also has a session info magic that in that it can show you the session info for all the kernels that you started, you have used to analyze your data. So that's a one single magic for all the session information. Okay. Okay, I assume that the SOS notebook is well received. <laughs> Okay, then 
Um, let's go into the uh, workflow part. So when you think of workflow, I think at least my first impression was workflows are really wonderful things, but they're hard to use. They are very rigid syntax, sometimes strange, and sometimes a GUI, and I need to, there's a very steep learning curve. So that's something that I tried really, really hard to avoid in SOS. So um, I'm just giving you a one slide summary of SOS syntax, and that's just all. You, that's all you need to know to, to understand the SOS workflow. So basically, first, SOS is based on Python. So that's familiar with most of you, I, I guess all of you. And then, as I introduce something called a script format of function calls. So basically, it helps you to include a large chunk of code to, into a Python function. For example, if you have an R function, which is defined by SOS to execute a piece of uh, script, that's the regular function format in, in Python, you can write that uh, piece of function in this format, say R, expand equal to two, and working directory, and this is the code. If you have expanded equal to two, this piece will be handled as a Python F string. If you do not have this parameter, this piece will be included as it is. There's no expansion or no magic. If your script has a bunch of braces, then you can say expand equal to, you can use another delimiters so that you don't have to double brace your code and to, to, uh, to, to use a F string, if you know what I mean. So uh, this is a convenient formatting to include scripts in the workflow. And this, I'm showing you a step, a workflow step. And it looks like long, but that's actually everything you need to know about a, a SOS workflow. So basically, if you look at the, the print, that's the last uh, negative four lines, the print, and the last two lines, they're the regular Python statements, right? The, the print and running a shell uh, function. All others are workflow directives. Say you have a header, that means this is a step of workflow. You have a parameter, means you can accept the value from command line. You have input, output, and depends. That specifies the input and output of the step, and you can have a task, which I will explain later. So basically, uh, a SOS workflow is a mixture of uh, Python statements and uh, workflow directives, okay? So now suppose you have a notebook, uh, with some interactive data analysis. In this particular example, it's just like you have a file in Excel format. You want to plot it in R, but the problem is it's kind of difficult to read Excel file from R, so what I did was I used a command in Bash to convert that Excel file to CSV so that R can read the CSV file and plot it. So this is a very basic uh, analysis. And done in three kernels, SOS, Bash, and uh, R, right? So um, if you want to convert that into SOS, all you need to do, if you just, just compare the left-hand side and right-hand side, all you need to do would be change the kernel name from R to SOS and add a name of the kernel, that's R, to the top. So what you end up with is like this. You have the three SOS cells, and the second one is actually a regular Python function, that's a SH function calling that script, and the third one is a regular R function calling that script with some parameters. So, so that you can just run your script in SOS, just like that. Run cell by side, run each function, that's also integrity data analysis. And then the magic happens if you convert your scripts into a workflow, all you need to do is add in section headers. So if you have added section headers to those cells, and the, say the first one is, is a global and a definition for every step to understand, and then the second step and the third step would be a plot, plot workflow, step one and two. After that, you can run the workflow with a SOS run magic. 
So basically, this provides you a way to run multiple cells of a notebook, right? If you have a long notebook with too many things, uh, instead of uh, run all from Jupyter, you can say SOS run this workflow. And the beauty of this is, is actually you can, at this stage, also run the workflow from command line because we also have a command line interface. So in, the, in this case, you can say SOS run that notebook and what the name of the workflow over there. And then the workflow can be executed from the command line. So basically, you have changed your notebook into a, into a command, right? So um, there are more benefits of converting your scripts into a workflow. And I'm showing you one that say you can define parameters. So you have your scripts written in, in notebook in Jupyter that's dealing with one input, right? And now you can just say, okay, the Excel file, I want it to be a parameter and it's a required path is a SOS type, say you need a path. And then uh, the, the other parameter has a default value and then you can just run the same workflow with a different name so that you can apply your workflow to another input file. <coughs> and then if you ever run that command again in the notebook, you will see something like this. Plot one is ignored due to a saved signature. So that's another thing about the, the benefit of workflows because SOS saves the signature of every step. Basically that consists of input and output statements and some global variables so that when the step is executed again, it will just be ignored. That's important to our work because bioinformatic data analysis can take a very long time. I mean, if you run a command, it takes several hours, even days to complete. And if not absolutely necessary, you don't want to do it again, right? For the, for, for, the, for the same files. Um, so right now I have been talking about workflows in the sense that we have a workflow that's called a plot, a plot one and two. That's, that's so-called a process-oriented workflow. That is to say, you, you, you define several steps that work on some input files and then the process will be run, logically speaking, one by one to analyze your data. But in, you, in many people's mind, workflow is actually something else. If you are familiar with make file, snake make, and some other make style workflow systems, they work in a kind of completely different ways. So basically, the, the workflow would just specify each single step, how to go from one, uh, one target, one file to another, and then you just specify the, the result. And then the workflow system will just run the necessary steps to get your result. You know that concept, right? Actually, SOS also supports that. So um, we can, if you compare the left-hand side and the right-hand side, that's a, the left hand side is so-called process-oriented workflow. The right hand side is so-called so outcome-oriented workflow. And the major difference is here. The difference is that that convert step is changed to a provide with a pattern. So basically, that step says, I provide a CSV file from a Excel file input, and I will run a command. And then workflow is triggered by the target the dash T over there, a, a target. So with this specification, what happens is that SOS would first try to see, okay, I want to generate that file, so I need to run the plot step, and I need that CSV file. And if that CSV file exists, then it's okay, I will just run that step. If that, is, that file doesn't exist, then it will look through all the other steps and see which step would generate a CSV file for me. So. In this way, if I run the workflow like this, I have the same thing. Basically, the convert step would be run and this plot step would be run to generate the PDF file. So actually, SOS allows very complex workflows and the, uh, so this just give you an example of a make file style workflow. Okay, 
I assume this is not too difficult. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, and in terms of handling large amount of data, say for example, if you have a step that's a, a handling a, a, a large amount of input file, and then in this particular example, I have a, a, a bunch of FastQ files, I group it by one, so that the files will be processed one by one, and with a parameter called concurrent, as well as we'll try to run those commands concurrently, running, starting several processes and, and handling your input all together, that's another benefit uh, compared to the uh, general Jupyter Notebook platform. But you may also say, if I really have a large amount of data, that's not enough, because my workstation is not powerful enough. If you were giving me 300 files, I need like 300 days to process it. I need to run that on a cluster. So that is why we provide a mechanism called a task. Task is defined here in the second example. What a task does is that task basically says the rest of the step is, is, a, is a independent execution unit. And then when it runs, like this example, it generates two tasks with hashtag over there. And when you click on the task IDs, it will show you different informations, and I can, uh, the, that actually just shows dash Q, localhost, and, and stuff like that. That's all the information about that particular task. And if the task run long enough, it actually will also tell you the CPU and the RAM used by that task, okay? And you might say, this is not useful because this is still localhost, right? Uh, if you have, I have many, in external tasks, but they're still local on my workstation. But the beauty of this task mechanism is that you can actually say, Q, I want to run the task on the cluster, on my cluster. When, this, when you specify this parameter, SRS will first go to a configuration file and look for the definition for that cluster. And then it will generate a task file, that's a task, and it will copy the input file to your cluster, and something magical happens here. It will also translate your task. By translation, I mean, you see that the input file was on a Windows system with a path like C backslash, and the cluster is on a Linux system, and with the help of that host definition file, SOS knows how to translate my path from one format to another, and then the task will be executed on the cluster. It will go to a slum or uh, the PBS system and run it, and you get your result, and the result will be automatically sent back to your local workstation. So what's happening here is that if you have this mechanism, and actually we have definitions for tens of servers on, on that host file, if I want to run this particular task on different servers, all I need to do would be change the name of the host, and then the test will be go all the way, even if they, share, they don't share the same <coughs> file system. And that's the way uh, we right now run our external tests on the clusters. Okay. Um, but you might still say, it's not that simple. If you want to run certain things on one cluster or on the other one, you need to have the commands over there, right? You say, I want to run fast QC, but if that class doesn't have the, that command, your task would fail. That's true. So the solution would be, everyone knows, use container. And here, basically, you can say, I want to run that scripts in a container. You specify the name of the container over there. And then what SOS does would be, first, it will pull the container from Docker Hub, and then it would run the script inside that container. Okay, from the output, you can see that. And, and imagine that if you have a large amount of jobs and then if you want to submit it to a cluster, then you can do the same thing. 
nobody object that idea? Uh, uh, my system admin said no, because they say Docker is not safe on cluster, so you, you can't do that. So that's, that's why we're working on singularity support so that we can run the containers on our cluster. If that is done, then the cluster will be something that only provides the CPU and the RAM for me, and I don't have to install anything on the cluster, okay? So um, I just want to end the introduction with a, a, just a simple fake example of workflows, a little bit complex, but it executed with option D, which means generate a direct acyclic graph to show me how the steps are connected. And the option P means generate a report for, for the workflow. And with those uh, parameters, what we get is like this. Say we have several steps and one step after each other, and that's, that's a DAG. And we also generate a report showing you the command, showing you how long each step take and, and things like that. It's a nice summary of the, of, of the thing that you have just done. Okay, um, I think this would conclude my second part about the workflow and this actually changed the way we work, okay? So basically, previously, we had a working environment like this. We have, we have to log on to many different clusters. We have to write scripts that's working for each of them. But right now, what we did was to have a JupyterHub server. With the JupyterHub server and with the SOS kernel over there, and all we need to do would be to communicate with the JupyterHub server and the SOS workflow engine over there would dispatch all our tasks to different clusters, uh, servers, and workstations. And at the end of the day, we have a bunch of SOS notebooks. And one notebook would contain everything, input, output, your script, and even if some script would be run a cluster, some, some of the script would be run different kernels, but that's everything for my data analysis. That's, that's something that's, that's way better than having a bunch of scripts lying all over the place, right? I, I bet you agree. <laughs> so, um, I would say, in, in, in summary, we have a pretty good notebook that allows you to use multiple kernels in one notebook. And with data exchange between kernels, that's also very helpful. And then we have a workflow system that, uh, that can be very complex and powerful. And combine those two together, and we have a notebook that, that, the, that can be used for both integrative data analysis and batch data processing. And it's reproducible because it contains everything that I have done for my project. And also, I can run many of the steps in containers so that the notebook can be readily reproduced by others. They don't have to rely on my working environment. So uh, with that, I would like to say um, SOS is licensed under a BSD license, and it's been released under PIP. Uh, it has a Jupyter Lab extension. Uh, you know, JupyterLab is still beta, kind of, so we are evolving with JupyterLab. It will take, a, 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 hopefully it will be stabilized soon. And then, uh, right now, it supports 11 languages. It supports three major browsers, but not Edge. Uh, we tried, it, it didn't work. And we support major operating systems. We support uh, JupyterLab, JupyterHub, and the, the Jupyter. And we support several task queues, including Redis queue. That's a simple Redis-based queuing system. And we support Docker, and we are working on Singularity as of now. And if you want to contact me, you can email me or use Twitter. And I would like to thank our core developers. Uh, Gao has been uh, helped me a lot on the design of the both systems. Uh, and testing, and Jun Ma helped me a lot on the front end. Henry is a student from Rice, and he helped me on the language modules for Julia and MATLAB, and Chris is our lead for the programming team, and he helped me the, for the Jupyter Hub deplo deployment. And there are some, some other people who supported or contributed to the project in different ways, 
and this project is supported by multiple grants. So I would say um, we have a live server. I would really appreciate it if you can go to our server and test all this. I have all the examples over there. And just send me the feedback if you like it or you, or you hate it. I mean, SOS has really changed the way we work with clusters with the biometric data analysis. I think if you are in a similar situations, I think it will also do the same to you. Thank you. <laughs> Question? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, yes. How would it look like? It will be the, like the, uh, happening at the same time. Because in this particular example, the will show. yes, yes, the ribbon would show. Yes. That, that's a really good question. So the, the way that type system is implemented right now is, is actually a modularized system that's one by one to one. In the, in the sense that I know that how to transfer one particular type in what way to another type in another language. And say, if I want to add a support for another one, you can just add that. So it won't affect the existing systems. And there's a, a extension system that you can, you can write your own extension for SOS that add your conversion system to SOS. Um, yes, because um, that's actually a yes, no. Be okay, so when you have the SOS load book, you have multiple live kernels. So if you have only one, as a uh, only one Python session, and then if you read that data in, and then all the cells belong to that session can access the, the data, no problem. You can, and that, that's just like a regular Python load book. But SOS also allows you to create multiple Python sessions. Say you can uh, say, uh, use Python, give it another name, say Python 1 and Python 2, and then you can transfer to Python 1, but Python 2 won't access that data. Arrow, arrow, right? Yeah, yeah. Yes. So under this, feather is actually based on arrow. So when we transfer large data, like a data from like even matrix, we use arrow in the back end, so to do the translation. But many other types that arrow doesn't support, we just use our own ways to get it, get the job done. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that, that, that depends on type. So for example, for the feather, uh, for data frame, we just depend on what, whatever feather would do to the missing data. But if it's for a regular R variable and we, we transfer the R and A to the Python long, so just those kind of a, Conversion that makes mo most of sense. So I mean, um, 
sometimes we can't get all the data over there because, for example, Julia has also a support for data frame, but it doesn't have the concept of row index. So if we have a R data frame that, that transferred to Julia, then the row index would get lost. But the bottom line is the majority of the data would be already there and you can analyze. And if you really want a row index, you can transfer row index in another format. And then you can continue to do your work. So we just want to be practical, not perfect. Yes, and I know that part. Rather than try to do this conversion Yeah, that's one of the reasons we uh, developed SOS because the multi language support from RStudio or RStudio Loadbook is quite weak in terms of multi language support. And the Beaker X is really good, but it focuses more or less on the Jupyter, no, on the Java family of uh, languages. It doesn't support SAS and the MATLAB, those tools that we use every day for biomatic data analysis. Okay, um, if there's no further question, thank you very much again for coming to my session and the, please go home and try and give me feedback, thank you.